He's just out of frame. We should do this. This is a lot cuter. Hey, whoever's out there. I go by Grumblebug, and I am currently reading The Jumbies by Tracy Baptiste. So here's what happened. <laughs> the short version is, I had to go pick up a thing for my apartment. I get to the store, I'm driving into the lot, and I realize that my partner, who knows me, knows me very, very well, <laughs> has sent me to pick up this order from a store that is about a block away from a half price books. I don't need any more books, okay? I very rarely buy books at full price, but that means that when I do come across an opportunity to get them for cheap, like at a library sale or something like that, I, I indulge. I have plenty of physical books on my shelves right now that I still need to read. In addition, I'm an avid user of my local library. I'm lucky to have a phenomenal library system in my local community, and I, well, I'm currently just shy of the max checkout limit that I'm allowed to take at any one point in time. So that tells you something, but that's another video. <laughs> my point is this should not have happened, but it did. And we're here. <laughs> I don't really expect book hauls to be a regular thing on this channel for a number of reasons. In fact, I've actually got a question for you guys about that at the end if you want to stick around and talk to me a little bit. But then again, I also didn't expect to bring home a stack of books in addition to a set of window blinds, which is what I actually left the house for. Uh, yeah, this... things happened. For now, it happened. These are here, so let's talk about what I got. Before I even walk in the store, they had a couple clearance carts sitting right out front, so I've got to check those out, right? And there's a fiction cart, and boom! Two things that I want to buy right off the bat. I'm not even indoors yet. The first thing I found was The Troll Hunters by Guillermo del Toro and Daniel Krauss. You might have heard of the Netflix adaptation of this, which is the first installment in the Tales of Arcadia series. I love it, but I am a sucker for a really great animated show that has a complex enough story for adults to appreciate. So this is apparently the book that inspired that series, though based on reviews it sounds like there are some pretty significant differences in how they tell the story. But the gist is that trolls exist. And unbeknownst to most humans, a war has been going on between trolls and a select line of humans for generations. Jim is our protagonist, and his uncle disappeared as a kid at the same time that hundreds of children were disappearing from their beds in California back in the 60s. Jim is literally dragged into an underground world and told that he is destined to become a part of this conflict. This book apparently depicts this world in a more gritty, dark, and gruesome way than we get in the show, which Sounds cool to me. I feel like the world lends itself to that really well, and I cannot wait to spend more time in a universe that I'm already in love with. Also, there are illustrations, so that's really cool. And like, yeah, that that looks. I mean, I'm creeped out by that. That sounds that seems pretty scary. At uh, the same clearance cart, I also picked up Vasa in the Night by Sarah Porter. This is a retelling of a Russian folk tale that takes place in modern day. I think is modern day. Fairly, it takes place in Brooklyn. <laughs> I know that this was big on booktube a couple years back, and I've been curious about it for a while now, but it's never quite made it into my library checkouts. I don't know whether this will be for me or not. I understand that it's also pretty dark in a different way than Troll Hunters is, and it's also more than a little out there. Like, that's the description people use in their reviews. Um, but I know very little about Russian folklore, and I am intrigued. And also, it was $2. And this one, by the way, this was 3 this, this is five dollars, okay? I love used bookstores. This is why I can't go into them. Once I actually made it inside of the store, the next book that I picked up was Arya Shah and the End of Time by Roshni Chakshi. I actually have this checked out from the library right now, and I haven't gotten to it yet because I have so many things checked out, but I'm convinced I'm going to love it, and they had a copy, so I bought it. This story is rooted in Hindu mythology, and it centers around Aryo, a girl who spends a lot of time at, or maybe lives at, I'm not entirely sure, but she spends a lot of time at a museum of ancient Indian culture and history that her mother curates. One day, she is dared by some kids from school to light a lamp that is supposed to be cursed. She lights the lamp, and in doing so, summons a demon who 
freezes time in some capacity and sets off to awaken the god of destruction. Aryo now needs to find the reincarnations of the Pandava brothers who are legendary demigods and she also has to journey through the kingdom of death also she can you know, save the world. I am not very well versed in Hindu mythology, which is part of why this appeals to me, but also it just sounds really exciting. And after reading just the first couple paragraphs, I was really quickly hooked. On a side note, I am not a cover by person. A book really needs to grab me with something else, like the summary or the first couple sentences, something like that. But if I were to buy a book just based on the cover, this would probably be it. <laughs> Now, I almost left this next one on the shelf, but right next to Aru Shah was another of Rashni Chakshi's books, The Gilded Wolves. This is another book to Darling. I feel like it is everywhere, and it's also constantly being compared to The Six of Crows. This is a heist novel, which means a cast of characters who are all very distinct, both in personality and in their skill set. And again, I've been curious for a while, but not curious enough to spend money on a copy. And I also just haven't gotten to it in my library queue yet. However, after probably my third <laughs> trip back to the shelf, I kept going back and forth trying to decide if I wanted to go for it or not. I realized that this is actually apparently an Alcrate edition and it's signed by the author. So I rationalized to myself that if I do read this and I don't love it enough to keep it, I should have no trouble reselling it and getting my money back because that's how that works, right? Just, just let me believe it. So I'm looking at Arya Shah and I'm looking at Gilded Wolves and then I turn around to the opposite bookshelf in this particular alcove. Alcove? Did I just say alcove or alcove? We'll pretend I said alcove. And I see this spine peeking out of me. So this is called The Twelve and it was written by Cindy Lynn. This, like Arusha actually, is an own voices fantasy novel, which means that the author has pulled from her own cultural heritage in developing the world. The magic system is rooted in the Chinese zodiac, and people can manifest different powers and abilities based on their birth year and the animal is associated with in the zodiac, or possibly its prevailing element. I'm not entirely sure the specifics of how it works yet, but you know, I'll read it and I'll find out, and I'll tell you. Our protagonist is a girl named Usagi who was born in the year of the wood rabbit. This apparently has granted her abilities like stealth, super senses, or at least super hearing it seems, and some kind of agility. The summary just says that she can cl jump clear over trees. So, you know, rabbit-like. But the world she lives in is ruled by the Dragon Lord, who has systematically rooted out everyone in the kingdom with zodiac powers, including Usagi's parents. So Usagi and her little sister, who is also powered, have to conceal their abilities while just trying to survive in the world. Things go wrong at some point. Usagi's little sister is exposed as having powers and she is taken away by the local dragon guard. Usagi then sets out to a mountaintop that is home to the Twelve, a mystical group of warriors who can train her and develop her abilities so she can rescue her sister, which I think is really cool rather than just, you know, Bah, I'm going to rescue my sister, even though I am a child and have no experience in battle. It sounds like the plot of this book revolves a lot around the training Usagi goes through and as she's learning from her mentors, which really appeals to me, actually. I didn't realize that I'm interested in training sequences, but that seems far more interesting to me right off the bat. There's also apparently a found family element as well, which I am always up for in my books. I'm hoping that we'll also get a look at what all of the different signs and elements of the zodiac look like in terms of the powers that they manifest in people because I would find that really interesting. I hadn't heard of this and that really surprises me, but I'm glad that I found it and I think it might be part of a duology. I'm not entirely sure. Okay, we are moving out of the YA slash middle grade fantasy stuff now into other genres because there was an entire store. <laughs> I didn't find any graphic novels that I was interested in, which made me sad, but I did come across The Secret Loves of Geeks, which is a follow-up to The Secret Loves of Geek Girls, which I already owned. So these are collections of comics and essays by professional, professional geeks. <laughs> That is to say, sci-fi and fantasy writers, illustrators, comic artists, etc. 
and they're telling their own real life stories about their experiences with love, relationships, dating, sex, that whole ballgame. I enjoyed the first anthology a lot more than I expected. I had originally picked it up on a whim from a local comic shop and it took me about two years to finally read it. But I wound up really enjoying not only the variety of voices but also how candid and real these were as sort of snapshots from the contributors' real lives. And I also really appreciate the sheer diversity of voices and experiences that the first anthology and this one as well seems to showcase. This volume specifically says that it includes contributions from diverse genders, orientations, and cultural backgrounds. And some of those include industry professionals like Margaret Atwood, Gerard Way, Patrick Rothfuss. <laughs> Anyways, I was surprised to find this and I am happy I did. Now, my last two buys are the only two new release, well, one of them's a new release, the other one isn't really new, it's more that there has been renewed interest, so um, recent bestsellers. Yes, it is a recent bestseller. We'll start with the nonfiction books that I have had my eye on for a while now, and that is Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race. This was written by Rennie Ito Lodge, who is a Black British journalist and author. And the concept for this book originated with a blog post that she wrote out of frustration at her experiences in trying to engage in the topic of race with white people. What she found across the board was that even in circles of people who were ostensibly considered progressive and forward-thinking, anytime she tried to address the topic of race and how it's connected with other issues of social justice, like feminism, the white people she encountered would instantly shut down. They just weren't open to discussing or even acknowledging that racism not only remains alive and well, but continues to be perpetuated by the structural systems on which societies are based. I know that a good number of books that take on this topic have seen a rise in readership recently, but there are a couple of reasons that this one in particular stood out to me right now. The first is that part of what the author talks about is the racial history of Britain and how much has been left out of their history books. Many of the other books that I've seen circulating right now take this on in the context of U.S. history, but as someone living in the States and training to enter the mental health field in the United States, I feel like that is a conversation that I'm already having in a lot of different places and have easy access to information about. I am much less familiar with what that historical process has looked like in the UK. And given how closely tied US history and British history are, this is a perspective that I'm really interested in expanding my knowledge of. I'm also particularly interested to read this right now because she has written an entire section specifically about feminism and the ways in which that movement and its various waves have consistently excluded black women and really any women who are not cisgendered, white, and middle or upper class. I'm very curious to read how the author couches that conversation and how that meshes with the representation in this book, which is one that I talked about in my mid-year freakout tag, which I will link to, I guess. I guess I do that now. That's cool. Anywho, um, Raising Our Hands is a book that I won through a Goodreads giveaway, so I need to read and review it, but it's talking about social and political action, or really more like inaction, among middle-class white women. And this was written by Jenna Arnold, who was one of the major organizers of the Women's March on Washington in 2017, which, while significant, also received a great deal of criticism for its lack of inclusion and intersectionality, which is a topic that this author covers. So I'm interested to read this book in general for a number of reasons, but I'm especially curious to read the two of these more or less together. I think that'll be interesting. The final book that I picked up, and I saw it just as I was about to walk to the register, but I saw the only copy sitting there, was Take a Hint, Danny Brown by Talia Hibbert. So I actually, the, the most recent book purchase that I made before this was Get a Life, Chloe Brown. <laughs> so I now have both of these and I'm excited to read both of them. I'm especially looking forward to this one though. I feel like this one's going to appeal to me a little more than this. I'm looking forward to Chloe Brown more because of the experiences and representation of the protagonist, Chloe. Chloe is a plus-size woman and she lives with 
chronic pain, so an invisible disability that impacts everything that she does in some way. Um, I also understand that she's very much like a list maker, a planner, and that's kind of kept her in some ways from living her life to the fullest as she comes to decide, which I, I can relate to that. Chloe's love interest is Red, who is her superintendent. And from what I understand, it's kind of a gruff start to the relationship. Like he's he's kind of abrasive, he's kind of a bad boy, and it's kind of maybe like a hate to love sort of situation, which I don't know how I'm gonna feel about that. I feel like if you're a jerk, then like why would I eventually change my mind and decide I wanna date you? But you know, that's me. Danny, meanwhile, is Chloe's sister. And Chloe is a queer woman. She is working on her PhD, which I think is cool. I don't feel like we read a lot of books about women who are working on their dissertation. So that's kind of neat. But in particular, I think I'm going to enjoy this romance and this love interest more than I'm going to Chloe's. Where Chloe is pitched as sort of like a hate to love sort of situation, Danny's experience is more of like a fake dating situation, but also maybe like a, I'm reading kind of like a friends to lovers. It's not necessarily, so my understanding is they're fake dating, but simultaneously Danny has just sort of been looking for a friends with benefits sort of situation. She sort of resigned herself to not really believing in love or romance is my understanding. Whereas her love interest is like a diehard romantic. And so it seems like sort of a situation where he's wanting more than she is. Like he wants an actual relationship. And so he's quietly kind of trying to convince her on that front while they're fake dating. And also I understand that the love interest has some sort of experience with, he either has PTSD or he gets panic attacks, something in that range. So I'm very interested in that representation and seeing how that is told. You can tell that I didn't script this part. So that's what happened when I went to the store for blinds and then passed a half price books and then things snowballed. But I'm really excited about some of these. If you guys have thoughts on any of these titles, what I should read first, things that I should know about them, let me know in the comments. I'm also really interested in hearing what you guys think about book hauls in general. So I know that these are a mainstay of booktube. I'm curious what in particular people enjoy about them so much since they do seem to be really popular. Is it that there's like a contact high almost from like, I didn't buy all these books, but this other person bought all these books. And so I'm like experiencing a vicarious serotonin rush through them. Or is it more about being exposed to a bunch of books at once and hearing about a bunch of titles at once? I'm curious, what do you like book hauls? Is this a thing you're interested in? Why, if you don't mind sharing, why, why do you like them or why do you think other people like them? If you had fun with this, please go ahead and give it a like. If you're interested in hearing more from me or maybe coming along on my soon to be purging of my library shelf in which I sort through everything and decide what I should actually keep versus what I should effectively unhaul and take back so it can go into circulation again, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. Thanks so much for hanging out with me. I hope you read something good soon and I will see you when I see you.